Welcome to this issue of Radon Continuing Education. In this program, we're going to review the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide to Radon as published by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, what we call the EPA. Before we get started too far with the program, what I'd like you to do is uh, look at your book. And in the beginning of your book, in the first couple of pages, there's a study guide and a list of objectives there. And I'd like you to take a minute or two and just read those objectives and then return to the video at this spot. And the reason for that is that it'll put in your mind the most salient points that I think I'd like you to remember. And it's going to help you to remember some of the material to have seen these objectives ahead of time. So if you just take a look at that for a minute and return here, we'll, uh, we'll get started from this point. Welcome back. I hope you uh, got a chance to take a look at those objectives. Now, the next thing I'd like you to do is a little further on in your book, there's a section called Visuals. And the first visual that's there, I would like you to turn to, and it has as a, as a heading EPA recommendations, as you see here uh, on the video. And there's a few more lines of information on the page. It should be the first visual. And if you'll turn to there, that would be good. If you need or want to make some written comments as you go along, I would recommend making them right there on the visual. The advantage is uh, that it'll be easy for you to make the comments you want, and it also helps you to remember the odds and end thoughts that you have while I'm going through the program. So we'll begin <coughs> with the EPA recommendations. As you see here, there's uh, four or five of them, and I'm, I'll bullet them on one at a time. Uh, you have them on your visual, of course, all at once. But the first uh, recommendation the EPA puts out is to have the home tested for radon. Well, that, that's an easy and obvious one. Uh, if it's a new home, they recommend to ask if it has radon-resistant construction in the, uh, in the home. And I'm going to talk about the details of radon-resistant construction in a few minutes uh, down a little further in the video. They recommend that the the house be mitigated, that it be repaired if the concentration is greater than or equal to four picocuries per liter. And typically, that's the only unit of radon that I'll be using in this program, picocuries per liter. So if you hear me using some numbers without a unit, the, the unit I intend is picocuries per liter. And they also point out that concentrations less than four still pose a risk. Their current thinking is that any concentration of radon is is, uh, carries with it some risk. So even a concentration of three has a risk and a concentration of two has a risk. But certainly as the concentration goes down, the risk goes down. I think of that as uh, with an example of, of uh, speeding in a car. If you're traveling at 90 miles an hour, the risk of having an accident is, uh, is higher than at 70 miles an hour. And 70 is, has a higher risk associated with it than 50, than 40, than 30. And one could ask the question, well, is there a speed below which there's absolutely no risk? And the answer is, well, yeah, zero. Uh, even if you're going 10 miles an hour, there's a certain risk of an accident there. And this philosophy is considered to be called the straight line no threshold hypothesis. And the upshot to it is that there is no concentration below which it's safe to have radon. That is, there's no risk associated with it. And one of the other recommendations that the EPA is putting out is to prevent test interference. And I have a visual on test interference, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that as well. <coughs> this visual points out the number of deaths per year that are estimated to occur due to different uh, hazards, radon being one of the hazards put on this graph. And you see here that the radon uh, has an estimate as high as 21 or 22,000 deaths per year. I list here a category called drunks. What I mean by that is drunk driving, uh, driving under the influence. And that, that is around 16,000 picocuries per, per liter, uh, 16,000 deaths per year, rather. And you'll notice that radon is, is significantly higher than that, than that estimate. And similarly, as compared to drowning, fires, et cetera, the, the radon is clearly a significant health risk in the United States. The Surgeon General of the United States states that radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States today. I don't even have to tell you what is the leading cause of lung cancer in the U.S. And that the only way to know if there's radon in a home that's hazardous is to test. There's no other way to tell. It's incorrect to say that, well, the house to the left and right of me 
doesn't have any significant radon, and therefore I don't either. That's simply not true. If you want to know what the radon concentration is in a home, you must test to know. That is the only way to figure it out. There are three testing options. And <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're all called short-term testing options. And I want to make a distinction between, between the home buyers and seller's guide to radon. Note the title, Home Buyers and Home Sellers Guide to Radon. The, these recommendations, these protocols, are designed for real estate transactions, transactions which occur in a period of 30 or 60 days. And house inspections need to be done in a matter of typically 7 to 10 days. And so there isn't the opportunity to do an annual measurement using perhaps an alpha track or, a, or maybe even a continuous monitor or an EPERM. It's simply that the measurements have to be done in short order, in usually within a few days. And so the EPA has come out with a, a set of recommendations on how to treat these short-term measurements. That's as opposed to the other document that the EPA puts out called the Citizen's Guide to Radon, which is a guide for doing measurements for a homeowner who simply wants to find out about the radon concentration in his or her home without being involved in a real estate transaction. In any case, the first of the three options is considered and called a simultaneous measurement. This is where you might take, for example, if you're going in with charcoal canisters, you might take your two canisters, two of them, and put them in the appropriate space where the radon concentration will be measured in the home and usually about four inches apart. That's the recommendation. And uh, you'll notice that both devices will produce a result eventually at the same time. So they're considered simultaneous measurements. And then whether or not one decides to mitigate is based on the average value of those two measurements. There's more that can be said about that, uh, but I'm not going to be covering that in this program. A second method, which is uh, not in popular use at all, is the sequential measurements. Again, the EPA recommends that two measurements be made. And then the sequential protocol, it's one after the other. So the individual, the tester, would go to the home, deploy one detector, come back, say, two or three days later, retrieve that detector, deploy a second one, come back two or three days later, retrieve the second one. Now, you see the tester has already gone to the home three times, as opposed to the other method where, in the simultaneous measurement, where the tester only goes twice. So the sequential measurement is not popular. And then finally, if you're using a continuous monitor, you might be using something such as a, a pylon radon monitor or a femtotech, and I know there are numerous other devices out there, uh, to do continuous monitoring. And for a continuous monitor to satisfy the, the short-term protocol, it re it's required that the monitor produce uh, a printout hourly so that every hour the radon concentration can be noted. And then after the 48-hour period, and the minimum measurement period is 48 hours, that's the minimum, uh, then one can average out the hourly values to get a radon measurement. And I'll have something more to say about the use of the continuous radon monitor, because there's, uh, there's an issue called ramp-up time that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. The other, uh, another concern the EPA points out is where should the measurement be made? And I think in this version of the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, they've resolved the issue quite a degree. Their recommendation is as follows. As you can see, it's in the lowest level of the home suitable for occupancy. And what do they mean by that? It's the lowest level you, that is the buyer, are going to use as a living space which is finished or, the, or does not require renovations prior to use. And so the buyer, who is the one who most typically pays for the radon test, helps to indicate where the measurement should be made. I think these paragraphs do clean it up a little bit. Later on in the, in the quiz portion of the program, that is when you're done watching the video, there's a quiz that I'd like you to answer the questions to. You'll see there's a few questions dealing with this issue of location, and I hope, I hope it will clear uh, any, any issues, any questions that you might still have about that. Radon's a pervasive gas problem. Currently, in the, in the United States, one out of every 15 homes is estimated to have a radon concentration greater than four, greater than or equal to four. That's 
of all the homes. Now, we don't know, I don't personally have the data uh, for a global evaluation of this, but this being the only data I have, I would estimate that chances are the entire globe has the problem, the entire world has this level of a radon problem. Now, if the home has already been tested, <coughs> what can the seller, what kinds of things should the seller be uh, dealing with? Well, if it's already been tested, then the first thing to do is to see if the test was done in accordance with the protocols in this Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. And there's a checklist in the back of the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, and we're going to be going over the checklist. And uh, the idea is to compare the test method with the checklist to see if the test that was performed already has met all of the criteria in the checklist. If so, then you should give the results to the buyer. That's the recommendation. Now, the buyer <coughs> may, may certainly accept that result, but also want an additional test done. Or they may say, well, I don't want to look at that result. I want to get my own individual test done. And these are the conditions here that might motivate a buyer to request a new test. Uh, it may be that the ch testing checklist was not satisfied. It may be an old test. Now, what do we mean by an old test? Is that three weeks old, two months, two years? And in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, they make a notation if the test that a buyer may want to have a new test if the, o if the current test is older than two years old. So there's a little guidance there in the sense that the, um, if it's older than two years, you might find buyers uh, motivated to request a new test. If the test occurred prior to renovations, right here, tested prior to renovations, in other words, the test was done, then the house was renovated somehow. It's not clear what, depending on the renovation, of course, whether or not that could have impacted the rate at which radon entered the home and therefore the radon concentration in the home. So that's, that's one issue there. And then if the test was done on the first floor, but let's suppose the, the new homeowner the current buyer is going to be using a level lower than where the test was done. Then a new test needs to be made in that lower level. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, if, if we're going to use a tester, <coughs> you see here in the first bulleted remark, in regulated states, contact your radon office. Now, the back of the home buyer's seller's guide, this is one of the valuables in the home buyer's seller's guide, I think. The back has a list of radon offices state by state. So if you're in a regulated state, they'll have a radon office. And in some non-regulated states, they'll have someone who's dealing with the radon questions. You can call that number and find out if they have a list of individuals. If you're in a non-regulated state or they don't have a list of individuals that they can recommend to you, you can go to the EPA homepage. Now, here's the EPA homepage right here www.epa.gov, et cetera. You have it on your visual. And uh, you can identify there, on that home page, the agencies that certify individuals for doing radon testing. And currently, the, there are two prominent agencies, the National Radon Safety Board and the National Environmental Health Association. Uh, you can get to those agencies, those organizations, by going to uh, nrsb.org or NRSB, uh, or NEHA.org. It's hard to keep track of all the acronyms. And, uh, and they have, they maintain lists of individuals that they have certified. That is, that those um, agencies believe these people, a certain list of people have had appropriate training so that they can do respectable radon measurements. And uh, most of them give out ID cards, these agencies, so the individual should have an ID card identifying exactly where um, uh, what agency he's certified with. And of course, you can contact the agency in order to uh, find out if that person is still certified. OK, so that's how you can check up on a tester to see if you're getting a respectable one. You'd think that deploying and retrieving a charcoal canister or, or, or an EPERM or whatever detector you're using would be a really simple thing to do. But it isn't. There are, uh, in, in any endeavor, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of ways of doing something wrong. And typically, there's only one or two ways of doing something right. And radon being a gas and a slippery gas at that, 
there's a lot of little things that need to be cared for so that the measurement r comes out representative of the radon concentration that's in the home. And if you have someone who's certified to do some testing, then that person has already studied all of those issues. Uh, okay, here we've talked about this visual already a little bit. The home, if it's already been tested, the buyer may accept the test results or the buyer may request a new test. Now, if there's going to be a new test, there are some items <coughs> that should have uh, attention paid to them. One is the location of the test. You can see the items here. I'm delineating them for you. The location of the test, where should it occur, who's going to perform the test, what type of test will it be? Will it be a short-term test, a long-term test? Chances are in real estate it's not going to be a long-term test. Uh, will you be using charcoal canisters, electrets, uh, continuous monitors? When will the test be performed? And who gets the results? Uh, typically it's the buyer who pays for the test, and typically the buyer gets the results as well. And you can see who pays for the test. Now one thing about the fact of the matter is that buyers typically pay for the test because they're the ones requesting the inspection of the house. But we need to bear in mind that in real estate, just about everything is negotiable. But fundamentally, the guy who pays for the test is the buyer. If there is a problem, that is, if the radon concentration comes out greater than four, greater than four picocuries per liter, when will mitigation occur? Who pays for the mitigation? And <clears throat> at some point, you're going to have to decide who the mitigator is going to be. A couple of additional comments regarding that lowest livable space issue. If there is some question about the lowest livable space in a home, you can check with your state radon office to get some advice. If you've got a really peculiar home that's structured in a strange way that's not, not perhaps common, you can call your state radon office for advice and help. And your radon tester, uh, assuming you're using a certified radon tester, can also give a lot of guidance in that regard. So just a couple additional comments that you'll find in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. <clears throat> if you're doing any renovations to the house, the recommendations in the guide are test before the renovation and again after the renovation. Now testing before the renov renovation makes a tremendous amount of good sense because if you've got a radon problem in the house and you're going to do a renovation, it's much easier and cheaper to install a radon mitigation system during the renovation rather than after when all the finished products are up. And test after renovation is a good idea to see if the renovation in fact has caused a problem that you didn't have before. And that's probably all I'm going to say about that particular comment. Now the new guide also tells us something about what's meant uh, with regards to the terms radon resistant new construction. And I'm, I have a sketch here. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And uh, buying radon-resistant construction makes upgrading easy, as you see here. And what I mean by upgrading easy is the radon-resistant new construction has pieces of a radon mitigation system already in, but the mitigation system is not prepared to be activated at that time. And so when it comes time to activate the system, it's relatively cheap and easy to do it. And the total cost of um, installing a radon mitigation system during construction is a heck of a lot less, and I'll quote some dollar values for you, is a heck of a lot less than retrofitting a house with a, say, a sub-slab depressurization system. Now here are some of the radon resistant features that you might look for in a new house. Now the houses, most houses, are going to be built with a gravel aggregate under the concrete slab. And the gravel aggregate here is listed as item number one, and it's called a gas permeable layer. But it's usually just gravel, and you might have four or five inches of gravel, and then a concrete slab poured on top of that. Between the gravel and the concrete slab, oftentimes you'll have a plastic sheet put down. And the purpose of the plastic sheet is, is this. It's going to help prevent the soil gas, and radon is a soil gas. It comes out of the soil. That's the preponderant way it has of getting into the house. It comes out of the soil through the gravel, that's easy because the gravel is very porous, up to the concrete slab, and the concrete slab is to some degree porous to the radon as well. Even though it looks like it's a nice solid concrete slab, radon can still diffuse through it. And so a plastic sheet is put between the gravel, 
me see if I can get this pointer back here. Between the gravel and the concrete is a plastic sheet that's put down to help diminish the rate at which radon will get into the house. Then a pipe is extended, and typically it's a four-inch uh, pipe. It's extended uh, from, the, from within the gravel, through the concrete slab, up through the house, as you see here, and up through the roof. Uh, and that, that, uh, that's part of the radon-resistant feature. That's the vent pipe. And then sealing and caulking. The pipe is put into a hole in the, in the slab, and some caulking is put around there. And if you have, you need to caulk or seal any other openings that occur in that concrete slab. So if you have an interior fringe drain along the perimeter of the slab, then uh, that will have to be capped off in some way. If you have a sump pump and a sump hole, therefore, you'll need to seal that off as well. And fortunately for us, the sealing materials needed for sealing these openings are available right off the shelf. And there are catalogs of companies that, uh, that vend this type of equipment. The junction boxes, the, uh, usually a small electrical box will be put up here. And the purpose of that is eventually, if we want to activate the system, what we're going to do is we're going to put an exhaust fan in this vent pipe. And that exhaust fan is going to have to be plugged in. And so, or wired in, rather. We're going to wire it into the junction box. And obviously, there's an advantage during construction to put an additional junction box up is relatively easy because the walls are open, et cetera, et cetera, and it's easy to run the wiring. Uh, so these are the radon-resistant features that I mentioned in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. Now, there are a number of device types that uh, are broken out into passive types or active types. Now, the difference fundamentally is that passive types don't require any power when they're put into the house to do a measurement, and active types typically do. So passive types would include, for example, charcoal canisters, uh, alpha track devices, if you're using those, electrets, uh, if you're using those, uh, LSC devices. This is a small, actually a small charcoal vial is really what it is. Those are all passive. They don't require any power. You just put them in the house. And in the case of the canister, you just peel off the tape, and, and that's, uh, that's doing some work. An active system is one such as I have here. This pylon monitor is active. It has to either be plugged in, or it can run off its battery uh, in order to operate. And those are called continuous radon monitors or, or continuous working level monitors. And you'll see I've identified here that charcoal canisters can be used for short-term measurements. Alpha tracks, typically used for long-term, uh, not very useful in short-term measurements. Uh, LSC, for short-term measurements, that's this little vial right here. And electrets can be long or short, uh, long-term or short-term. And of course, the active ones, you can just leave them plugged in for as long as you want and get long or short-term values. So those are fundamentally the different device types. You remember I made a comment earlier about continuous monitors, that they need to have an hourly printout. There's uh, an additional concern about that, which is called the ramp-up time. And I have on this graph, <coughs> in this visual, a sample. I made this up. This is not real data. But a sample, suppose you had a house that has a concentration in it of four. And somehow we know that ahead of time. Uh, or we're going to know it in a, in a few hours after the monitor has been in the house. When the monitor is placed into the house, the monitor is filled with outside air. It, does, it takes a few hours for the monitor to come into equilibrium with the radon concentration in the basement or wherever the measurement's being made. And so, for example, if you look at this graph here, you'll see that the concentration on hourly printout, the first value might be very close to zero, and then it's on the way up. And you can see the concentration printed out by the monitor doesn't get up to the house concentration until about four hours will have passed. Now, the manufacturer of the monitor can tell you what the ramp up time is. In this example, the ramp up time would be taken as four hours. It takes four hours to come up to the equilibrium value in the home. And <clears throat> I mentioned that the minimum measurement period is 48 hours, and that remains true. 48 hours no matter what device you use. However, for continuous monitors that have a ramp up time, such as this one, where the ramp up time is four hours, the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide points out that you can uh, eliminate the first four hours of data from your measurements, and then average all the others in order to come up with the average value for the house. 
In other words, they're permitting you to have only 44 contiguous hourly measurements. Take the average over those 44 contiguous hours. So I remind you the measurement period remains 48 hours, but in the case of continuous monitors, uh, you're allowed as few as 44 contiguous hourly measurements upon which to take an average, and then that average is what the, the decision is based on whether or not to mitigate. Now I want to talk about tampering. <coughs> tampering is a, uh, can be a significant issue in the radon industry, and there's been lots of steps taken to deal with tampering. And I could talk for a couple hours on tampering easily. In fact, uh, we do have a program, we do have two, two programs on tampering alone. Uh, one called tampering in the radon industry and the other tampering by the numbers. So I'm going to make just some comments about tampering. The EPA, Home Buyer Seller's Guide, says we need to pay attention to tampering and we need to take steps to prevent tampering. So what are the kinds of things we can do? Well, there's the frequent, frequent recording of radon concentrations. If you have the continuous monitors and you're doing hourly measurements, then you do satisfy that. You are getting uh, frequent measurements. Now, the radon concentration in a home, as most of us are well aware, uh, varies wildly from hour to hour and day to day. And so it's not unusual to have radon concentrations going from 10 to 15 to 20, back to 6, up to 15, back to 8. Those kinds of variations are very common. But if you have frequent recording um, and you find that the values for the first 40 hours are bumping between 6 and 15, and they're varying there between 6 and 15 for those points. And then the last eight hours, they all drop down to 2. Well, then that's suspicious to me. And I'd wonder, well, gee, why did that, the last 8 or 10 hours all go down to 2 picocuries per liter? What happened that was different in the home in that case? So it, it doesn't tell you that tampering has occurred, but it does give you some information um, and some advice in effect. I want to go to the bottom of the list here and take a look at the non-interference agreement. I've included a copy of a non-interference agreement in your package, and that's uh, an agreement. It's just a sheet of paper says that uh, I will not interfere with the test in any number of ways. And you can have the occupant or homeowner sign that document. Uh, I believe, as I think many people in the industry believe, that's a very useful technique. It puts the occupant on alert that uh, there's a radon test going on, and don't putz with the test in any way. Another item that you can use are tamper-proof seals. Now, I have a sample of some right here, tamper-proof seals. And uh, these are just, uh, just sticky tape, really. And they can be peeled off of this sheet and then uh, stuck on the windows and window casements so that if the window is open, the seal will be torn. And you can't remove these seals without tearing them from the windows. You can remove them from this plastic sheet okay, but you can't remove them from the window without tearing them. And so uh, these help to make sure that the windows have remained closed during the measurement period. Other kinds of uh, tampering devices with regards to um, EPERMs, you see here, EPERMs now come with a, uh, a Loct Loctite tab, plastic strip here, and I think most of us know how these work. You can seal it and once you've, once you've connected this together here, see if I can do that. There we go. Once you connect this together like this, the only way to, re the only way to remove that plastic seal is to, to cut it off. It's not possible to slide it off. And that prevents, for example, the closure of the, the EPERM chamber. It guarantees that it'll stay open. There are lots of, lots of devices for uh, tampering that help to diminish the amount of tampering. There is, if you have a device, for example, that can record pressure and temperature, then that gives you some sense of what's going on in the house as well. If the temperature is 70, suppose the first six hours of the measurement, the temperature is 70, and, the, and then the middle 40 hours of the, the measurement, the temperature drops to 40, and it's a winter measurement. Well, you have to wonder why it dropped to 40, especially if there were people living in the house. Uh, how did that happen? It gives you some information. Again, does not assure you that any tampering has occurred, but it gives you some information. Same thing with uh, recording the barometric pressure. And um, a company called the Radon Testing Corporation of America was gracious enough to loan us whoopee, this device, which, which I happen to like. <coughs> 
for charcoal canisters. Can we see this? Oh, yeah, we see this a little bit. Let me get this out of the way. And I think we can see this a little better, and I'll open it up in just a second. And this device is great. I like it because uh, it's useful for charcoal canisters. And it opens up simply, and it looks like a sort of a fishing box. And I think inside, if you can see inside, there's room for two charcoal canisters. I'll put one there, and see what I'm doing here. Put the other one there. And you just deploy the charcoal canisters, open them up off the tape. And there's a couple of electrical devices here, uh, a couple of switches and things. You close the box, <coughs> close the lid. There's lots of vents in this box so that the ear that's in the, in the box is also the, has the same radon concentration as the ear in the room being tested. Nice thing about this box is it contains a proximity detector, a proximity detector, and a motion detector. If the box is lifted and moved, say, to the outside, the box will know. If you try to cover this box, that's always been one of the hazards with charcoal canisters. If you cover the top of the box, then it's possible to diminish the rate at which radon goes uh, the top of the charcoal canister. Let me start that again. If we cover the top of a charcoal canister with any one of a number of things, then it's, it's possible to diminish the rate at which radon goes into that canister. Here in this box, <coughs> if you try to cover this box, it has a, a proximity detector. If you try to cover this box, uh, that will be indicated inside the box that it's been covered or that something has gotten close to the box. So this is a great anti-tampering device uh, for charcoal canisters. And there are probably other kinds of anti-tampering devices that uh, you, you may well be aware of. But these are some that were listed in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. The guide also points out the distinction between long-term and short-term measurements. Now, a long-term measurement is a measurement greater than 90 days. Short-term, between 2 and including 90 days is the short-term measurements. But again, as I pointed out in real estate transactions, because the minimum measurement period is 2 days, 48 hours, the, uh, most of the measurements occur in two and three days. And so they're almost all short-term measurements. Now, the concerns for a short-term measurement uh, I've listed here. Again, they're out of the, home, the whole thing is out of the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. If the test is less than four days, and the majority of them are, if the test is less than four days, then closed house conditions need to be established 12 hours prior to testing, 12 hours prior to testing. Now, closed house conditions typically means that all of the windows have to be closed. Uh, the um, measurements are not to be done during severe storms or high winds, for example. Well, let me go back to the closed house conditions for 12 hours prior. Not only do the windows uh, need to be closed, but typically the doors are closed, and only one door is left for exit and entry. And so those tamper seals could be put on the other doors along with the windows to make sure that they haven't been used. Uh, closed house conditions fundamentally ask that no air from outside be brought in to be exchanged with the inside air artificially or through mechanical ways. Now the house is going to breathe by itself in any case, but the sense here is that closed house conditions mean don't bring it in intentionally with a mechanical means. So no attic fans, no whole house fans. Um, the, some fans are allowed to be used. Uh, if they're used only for 10 or 15 minutes at a time, or short periods is the way it's said, um, so you might have in the kitchen an exhaust fan. You might have that on for five or 10 minutes. Or a bathroom fan might be on for five or 10 minutes. Those things are allowed. Um, of course, I mentioned not during severe storms or high winds. And the reason for that is severe storms and high winds typically lower the atmospheric pressure in the house. And that can spike the radon concentration by a factor of three or four. So normally, let's say the radon concentration in the house might be six. And a storm comes through, during the period of the storm, that radon concentration can easily go to 20 or 30. So uh, the idea is don't measure during those storm periods. Uh, follow the instructions with the detector. You'd think no one has to note that, but follow the instructions. If you're using detectors, um, uh, whatever, whatever detector you're using, keep it 20 inches above the floor, away from drafts, high temperatures, high humidities, and exterior walls, all of those. Um, criteria there to prevent those effects, those parameters from having effects on the detector. Charcoal canisters, for example, can be imp impacted by high temperatures. 
and drafts, and that's one of the reasons we keep it off the floor. And exterior walls will often have ghost drafts. Uh, high temperatures and high humidities do have an impact on some devices. Uh, I mentioned here again, minimum 48 hours, or as the test instructions say. Now, the test instructions may say more than 48 hours is the minimum measurement period, uh, but the EPA's minimum measurement period is 48 hours. And then uh, make sure you record the information correctly after the test is done, that is the location of the test, who did the test, etc. And there's usually a form to fill out for that. Uh, and, and then seal and return it to the lab. If you're using a passive detector, of course you're going to charcoal canister, you're going to seal it, return it to the lab. If you're using EPERMS, you might have the voltage reader yourself, and at that point you can and do the um, radon calculation right there on the spot. So these are some of the concerns. Uh, it discusses also, the guide also discusses advantages of using a qualified radon tester. And there's a number of advantages. As I mentioned earlier, it is, uh, you would think it'd be very easy to just deploy a charcoal canister, go back, pick it up, and, and that's the end of it. But it, that just isn't the condition. We've already, we've already seen that there's lots of parameters that have an effect on the quality of the measurement. The, uh, what the radon tester can do is the radon tester can look at the home, identify where the measurement should be made, and obviously in consultation with the buyer, typically, and, uh, and identify the deployment of the test kit, can explain the required house conditions to the homeowner or occupant, that is uh, typically the closed house condition, uh, can get the occupant to sign the non-interference agreement and discuss interference issues, and um, analyzes the data, reports the results. And the other thing is the, the radon measurement by a tester by a, a qualified tester is an independent measurement. And so there's an objectivity to that value that if the home buyer or the home seller do it themselves, that objectivity is not going to be uh, quite, quite as clear in the results. In evaluating results, it's useful to know a few things, that the average indoor level in the United States is 1.3. The average outdoor level, I believe I mentioned earlier, is 0.4 picocuries per liter, and sometimes some devices will make radon measurements, actually radon daughter measurements, in units of working levels, and if that's the case, the conversion factor is 0.02 working levels is equal to 4 picocuries per liter. I won't spend too much time on that. And the other additional comment they make is that if the short-term measurement is 4.1, that is just a, just a tad above 4, then there's still a 50-50 chance that the annual concentration is less than four. Okay, that's all I want to say about that. Now, the radon risk. Now, I, I see this one here on the, um, on the video is not as crisp as, as I would like it to have been, but it's really the best we were able to do. And in any case, you have this table in the visuals. It should be really crisp right in front of you. And you can look at the visual in your book. The, this first table talks about the radon risk if you have never smoked. And then we're going to look at the next table, which is the radon risk if you have smoked. And to talk about this, this is a, a nice, easy way to remember this. If you take a look, for example, at four picocuries per liter, about two people are expected to get lung cancer. That's two out of 1,000 who are exposed to this concentration. Notice here, over a lifetime. And uh, we can talk about what we mean by a lifetime if we want. I don't think I want to. But the, um, no, the point I want to make here is that the number of people who get a lung cancer is roughly half of the concentration. Two people out of 1,000 are expected to get a lung cancer when the concentration is four. When the concentration is eight, it's almost half the concentration. Three people can get lung cancer. At 10 picocuries per liter, four people. Again, just about half of the concentration. Two people, that's again out of 1,000, of course, uh, could get a lung cancer. So if somebody says, well, the concentration is uh, 50 picocuries per liter in my house, how many people are going to come down with lung cancer from that? Well, if it's 50, it's going to be probably 22, 23, 24 people, just under half uh, the number of people as the numerical value of the radon concentration out of 1,000 people. So that's, a, that's really a pretty easy way to remember these kinds of things. And, of course, the table also makes comparisons uh, with other kinds of risks that humans take. Now, this is if you've never smoked. If you take a look at the table for the case where you have smoked, then this, too, is easy to remember. Notice at four picocuries per liter, about 29 people can get lung cancer. Now, if you didn't smoke, it was about two people could get lung cancer. 
So here we have a factor of roughly 15 times more. If you look at 10 picocuries per liter, for example, about 71 people would get cancer. Well, before it was just under five, so it was four, and this is roughly 15 times that value. And you'll notice that 20 picocuries per liter, 135 people get lung cancer, and that's uh, approximately 15 times what we had before. What we had before here was eight people. So it's 15 times the number of people. So the f if you smoke, if you're a smoker, then your risk of coming down with a lung cancer due to radon is 15 times as large as if you're not a smoker. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Radon and its daughter products are the health hazard, and they're all radioactive. The daughter products are solid, and there in the room now, if you're smoking, those daughter products can adhere to the smoke particles, and you're going to inhale those smoke particles, actually drawing in the daughter products, which would not be drawn in otherwise. And being solid, they have an ability to adhere to your lungs. As they decay, they can do damage at that point. And so the risk factor, if you're a smoker, is uh, not do these values are not because you're a s smoker per se, but because of the impact smoking has on your ability to hold on to radon. Now we're coming up to the testing checklist, which uh, in a lot of ways is the core of the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. And it's broken down this checklist into three categories, before, during, and after. And it's really straightforward, not particularly difficult to remember. I do recommend that you use a checklist and so that you can go to a house and just say, is this condition been met? Yes, 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 no, boom, yes, 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 no, oh, I better fix that, okay, and then yes, and then you're done. It's just quick and easy and you're less likely to forget anything. If you're like me, you need a checklist. The before portion of the checklist <coughs> includes these items. Notify the occupants that a test is in progress or is about to be put into progress. Remember the minimum exposure time is 48 hours. If the test is period is between two and four days, you gotta have closed house conditions 12 hours prior to the beginning of the measurement. And then, uh, for any short term test, that is any test 90 days or less, you have to establish closed house conditions for the entire term of the test. Use a qualified device, follow directions and hire only qualified individuals. A couple more items for the before part of the checklist. Use some methods to prevent interference of the device and of the conditions uh, in, the, in the room that's being tested. And if there's an active radon mitigation system in the house, it should be operating, it should be on. So that's, that's all there is to the before checklist, not too much. During the, during the test, the checklist includes just these four items. Uh, maintain closed house conditions, We've already seen that. Operate heating or cooling systems normally, except ear conditioning systems must be on interior ear only. If you have window ear conditioners, this is where it's uh, most common, I think. If you have window air conditioners, those air conditioners can be set to be bringing in outside air, cooling it, and putting it into the house. Or it can be set to be taking room air, cooling that, and returning that to the house. And here they're telling us that we should be using those air, condi air conditioners only in the interior air mode. Uh, so they're telling us that. Active mitigation systems should be on and operating normally. And then don't disturb the test device. So these are some of the things that are listed for the during checklist. And then after. Return the device promptly to the lab if you're using a lab. Of course, if you're doing the analysis yourself, you certainly can do that right away. Fill out the information on any forms completely, and then mitigate the home if the concentration is greater than or equal to four. And they also recommend that you document uh, that test conditions were not violated during the test. You simply have to do the best you can with that. Now, the costs of radon mitigation, typically if you're going to mitigate a house um, that has, that's finished and has not been mitigated and has a radon problem, the current values range, the quotes now are between $800 and $2,500. Some of the mitigation concerns is that ceiling is essential but typically inadequate to reduce levels below four. And sub-slab depressurization is, more com is the most common method of mitigation systems. I'm going to make a comment about this ceiling issue, which I hope will, hopefully will make us remember it better. And again, on this visual here, 
It's a little blurry on the video, but uh, you have it again crisply in your visuals. And a subslab mitigation system works as follows. Here you can see that vent pipe we talked about earlier. And this one has an exhaust fan hooked into it. And a few, in this particular case, a couple of suction points plus one more suction point over a sump pump. Um, the mitigator will tell you how many suction points you're going to need. And that exhaust fan draws air from the gravel underneath the slab through these suction points, excuse me, up and outside into the atmosphere. And that prevents the radon from getting in the house because we actually draw the gas out of, from under the slab before it has the opportunity to get into the house. Now, I want to talk about the sealing issue. If we fail to seal the openings, for example, say, fail to, to seal the sump pump opening or, or the interior French drain or cracks in the floor, etc., then what will happen is the pressure is lowered beneath the slab and air from the room will go in through those cracks into the bottom and then out through the vent pipe. And we'll actually be venting not only the soil gas beneath the slab, but also some of the air that's in the room. That's going to diminish the effectiveness of the mitigation system. So sealing is really an important part of a sub-slab mitigation system. With regards to renovations, we actually talked about this earlier. Test before the renovation and then again after the renovation. And I mentioned before that the reason for that is if you test before the renovation occurs and you have a high radon concentration, it's, uh, that's the ideal time to put in a mitigation system. And testing after the renovation tells you whether or not you, still, you may or may not still have a problem. When should you retest? Well, if your living patterns change, you may want to retest the home. For if you're now, suppose you were just living on the first and second floors of a house that has a basement, but now you're going to use the basement, well then, uh, and, you were te and you tested on the first floor, you'll want to test in the basement now to see if there's a high rate on concentration there. Test in the future. You may want to retest, and there isn't too much guidance in the guide in this regard. There is one point in the guide that says that a buyer may wish to have a retest if the former test was more than two years old. That's the guidance that I've seen, and so you may want to retest every couple of years. Now, with regards to mitigation, there, the EPA has a set of mitigation standards that are out there to tell, tell you what kinds of materials to use in a mitigation system and how to install those materials. And uh, most mitigators, I'm put my stick my neck out a little bit here, most mitigators are using the EPA's mitigation standards. If you're in a regulated state, a state that has laws and rules of how to do radon testing and mitigation, Check with them to see what mitigation standards they're asking uh, that you use. If you're in a non-regulated state, it's recommended use the EPA's radon mitigation standard. Now, prior to doing the work, here's some of the things that the guide says the mitigator should do. Mitigator should review the test results. He should know how much radon is in that home. He should also determine if additional tests should be done. Maybe the one test wasn't enough. He'll evaluate the problem and provide a detailed proposal. He should tell you there's going to be one suction point or two suction points. We're going to put the fan over here and the, the vent pipe over here. Those kinds of details should be told to, the, to the, uh, whoever's paying for the mitigation. Uh, the mitigator will design the radon reduction system and install it according to mitigation standards. And you'll probably want to ask the mitigator, are you, what standards are you following? Do you intend to follow in this mitigation? And then the mitigator will also determine that the system is working effectively. This means that the mitigator is expected to see to it that a measurement is made after the mitigation system has been installed. Now, this doesn't mean that the mitigator is required to do the test afterwards, although um, that's not uncommon. There is the issue of the conflict of interest. The fellow did the, mitigate, did the mitigation, and uh, so there's so he'd like to see the concentration come out below 4, and a lot of mitigators will guarantee that it will come out below 4. But you can see the potential for a conflict of interest there. And so oftentimes, the mitigator will simply uh, indicate that he's going to hire somebody to do the test or that the buyer or the individual paying for the mitigation can have the test uh, performed by an independent agent. There are other conflicts of interest that we face every day. 
if, uh, if you're feeling sick, you go to your doctor and maybe you're coughing a lot and the doctor says, uh, well, you know, you've, you've got bronchitis, so I'm going to put you on these series of shots or something. I don't know if shots are appropriate for bronchitis, but, but suppose he says that. But really, uh, do you just have an allergy to the atmosphere at this time of year? Or are you going to trust your doctor to do that, to give you the series of shots that, will be use that may be useful to you? There's a potential conflict of interest there. Um, but most of us trust our doctors because they're well-trained and they carry licenses and certificates. And if you're using a certified individual, uh, I believe that there's a certain amount of integrity in that individual's uh, having become certified. Whether or not we test for radon in water is another issue. Um, radon is a soil gas. It, it's uh, in the soil beneath the homes, typically. And it will dissolve into the water. And so the water in the home, or beneath the home, underground, the water is going to have radon in it. Uh, we've done uh, hundreds of radon and water measurements. We've never seen uh, water taken from the soil or beneath the soil or from anyone's well that didn't have some radon in it. And <clears throat> the radon comes out of the water very easily. So if you're on a well, for example, and you draw the water from the soil, and then you take a shower. Well, that water is pretty heavily agitated when you're taking a shower, and the radon is going to come out of that water, and you're going to be re breathing that radon and air concentration for whatever the 10 or 15 minutes uh, you might be in the shower. And of course, the other activities where water is used, say a clothes washer, where the water is, is very turbulent, and I would assume that all the radon in, the, in that water would come out of the water, and it'll enter into the house. And that's going to add to the radon and air concentration. So the recommendations are, as you see here, test for the radon in water if the radon in air is elevated in the home and if you're on a private well. Now, if you're on a municipal water supply, it's expected that there won't be much radon in that water. And the reason for that is municipal water supplies have large holding tanks, and it may be days from the time the water is taken from the holding tank and, and gone to your house. During that time, the radon concentration should have dropped significantly. Also, a lot of municipal water supplies are reservoirs. And surface water is not expected to have any significant radon in it either, because the wind blows across the surface of the water regularly. And that's going to agitate the water enough that the radon in the water in the reservoirs will also come out. So the condition here is test for radon in water if the radon in air is elevated and if you're on a private well. That's the recommendation by the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. Now, if you do have a radon and water problem, and there's so much to say about the radon and water issue right now that I'm not going to get into, but if you have a radon and water problem, there are two ways to deal with it. One is that using activated charcoal tanks, which I've abbreviated as a GAC tank, and the second is using the method of aeration. Now, <clears throat> and you can mitigate you can mitigate the water in either of two ways, although there's one that's, that's uh, the most reasonable way, I think. Point of entry into the house, that is, if you have a well and the well water comes in in a pipe that's in the basement, it usually goes to a holding tank. I've got a couple of schematics I'll show you. Comes into a holding tank, that's the place to treat it, because then all of the water that gets into the house from that point on will have been treated. Point of use is where you might treat it, um, say, in the kitchen sink. So you might have a small charcoal tank where the water that comes to the kitchen sink goes through a charcoal tank and then, and then comes out of the faucet. And then that water would be uh, low radon concentration water. The problem with that is the water everywhere else in the house may still have a high radon problem. Now, I've seen a number of houses mitigated for radon and water. In every case uh, that I've seen, it's been at the point of entry into the house and not at the point of use. The aeration method consists of a, a diagram something like this. Uh, the, here's the holding tank <coughs> for the well. And the well water comes in this way. There's a few valves here. And gets into a large storage tank. And a blower blows air through these pipes into the water in the tank. And that's going to agitate the water. And it's going to get the radon to come out of the water. And the radon is going to take up this space up here. And we'll put an exhaust fan here. And that air will be exhausted out with the high radon concentration in it. Then a, a pump is used to pump water from that holding tank into a, another holding tank, which uh, will deliver water for the house as the demand occurs. 
you can see how this system works. Now, <clears throat> aeration systems are typically more expensive than activated charcoal systems. But they're more useful for concentrations for radon and water, typically above what I have heard around is 5,000 picocuries per liter. Now, that may sound like a really high number. Compared to radon and air, it, it is typically a really high number. But radon and water concentrations are commonly 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 picocuries per liter. That is not unusual. And uh, in the state of Maine, some radon and water concentrations have been discovered on the order of a million picocuries per liter. So if your house has more than 5,000 picocuries per liter, a GAC unit probably is not going to be uh, the instrument of choice, the mitigation system of choice. You probably want to use an aeration system. The GAC unit works in the following way. Here's the well water coming in this pipe. Here's your holding tank. And the water comes up this way and goes through the charcoal that's in this tank. And you might have a couple of cubic feet of charcoal in here. And charcoal's a great absorber. Latches on to almost everything. And as the water comes up through the charcoal, the charcoal will filter out the radon that's in the water. And then uh, that water can go into the house on demand as needed. And this is fairly effective for concentrations. Again, as I've heard, a rule of thumb about 5,000 picocuries per liter. The, um, one of the reasons it's not too effective above 5,000 is that the tank, the charcoal tank, is going to have a lot of radon in it. Now, radon's half-life's under four days, 3.82 days, if I remember correctly. And it's going to decay, and the radon won't be there any longer. And most of its daughter products are very short-lived on the order of minutes. And so the daughter products won't be there except for a couple of final daughter products. And those final daughter products, which are radioactive, have half-lives that are very, very long. And they will remain in the tank for a long time. So as the days and months go by, the tank's radioactivity is going to increase. And it can come to some point where the tank has enough radioactivity in it that it requires special handling as a radioactive waste product. And ideally, we'd rather not go there because of the expense in dealing with that particular issue. Now, there is a computer program that the EPA puts out called CARB-DOSE, C-A-R-B-D-O-S-E, CARB-DOSE. And you can download it off the EPA's homepage. Just go to epa.gov, go down to Radon, and go look for it. And you'll find carb dose. You can download it on your computer, and you can use it right then and there. Um, and it tells you, if you give it certain information, what the radon and water concentration is, the number of people in the house, it can tell you uh, how long it will take. It has a way to estimate how long it will take for a typical GAC tank to become a, an expensive waste problem. And so you might run the carb dose program and find that it takes uh, eight years under the conditions you've given it for the gag tank to become a problem. So maybe after five or six years, you'd switch out the charcoal in that tank in accordance with state and local codes and uh, fill it with fresh charcoal. The other way to measure the radioactivity in a gag tank is simply to go down with a radiation monitor, an appropriate one, and measure the radioactivity along the surface of the tank. And there are guidelines as to what the readings ought to be uh, before it becomes, a, again, a toxic waste problem. And you might monitor that every couple of years just to make sure that you're not going up too fast. The Home Buyers and Sellers Guide also lists a series of myths, uh, 11 myths. I'm not going to discuss all 11, but I've mentioned three of them here. One, scientists are not sure that radon is a real problem. Uh, that is simply not the case. The overwhelming number of scientists do recognize that radon is a real problem is, in fact, a significant health risk. Uh, as we saw earlier, the Surgeon General has indicated it is. The EPA certainly indicates it is. The National Academy of Sciences indicates it is. Uh, so fundamentally, scientists are well aware that it is a real problem. I'm not saying there aren't a couple of scientists out there who are not in agreement. But uh, if you ask 100 of them, I'm willing to bet 98 of them will come along and tell you that it is a real problem. <coughs> Second myth here that I mentioned radon's a problem only in certain parts of the country. Uh, that's just not true. Now, it's certainly true that in some parts of the United States, there, the radon is a bigger problem than in other parts of the United States. But there's no part of the United States in which radon has not become a problem. And the uh, third myth that I put down here is, I've lived in my home for so long, it doesn't make sense to test it now. That, that's simply, um, simply untrue. No matter how long you've been in the house, 
uh, if you have a radon problem, it would be great to eliminate it. It's, in a sense, it's like smoking. It, ha it has health risks very similar to smoking. And if you've been smoking for 50 years, does it make sense to stop smoking now if you could? And the answer, of course, is yes, it is. It makes a great deal of sense. We know that you get, start getting healthier right away, that the amount of damage uh, stops uh, almost, almost immediately. Not that there isn't still some risk from your history of it, but additional damage uh, is diminished dramatically if you stop. And the same is true for radon. Also, if there are other people living in your house, it's very wise, I think, if you care about those other people, to do a radon measurement and determine whether or not radon is a problem in that house. And furthermore, at some point, that house is going to be sold. And if you can solve the radon problem, if it has one, before e a buyer even gets to the house, that's going to make the house that much more saleable. That pretty much ends the review of the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, and I'm not suggesting that I've covered every single detail in the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, but I've covered uh, a significant amount of it, and uh, what I believe are the most salient points, and you're obviously free to peruse the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide, and it's in your book. It's the um, it's second to the last part of your book, and I would recommend that you look through that. You're certainly going to have to look through parts of it to find out some of the answers to the quiz questions. The last part of your book are the quiz questions, and if you wouldn't mind just going through those quiz questions, putting them on the answer page, and either mail or fax them back to us, we'd appreciate that so that we can get your award letters sent out. Thank you.